Shane Kilkelly. And I'm Kyle Thompson. And you're listening to General Intellect Unit. And in this episode, we'll be looking at part two of the uh, documentary series called All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. Uh, and this, uh, this episode of the uh, film series is called The Use and Abuse of Vegetational Concepts, uh, which I think is a pretty fantastic title. Um, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's wonderful. Um, and in, in this one, um, Curtis kind of like talks about... So in the, in the first film, um, he was kind of going on about this... Uh, I, how this idea of a self-sustaining and self-stabilizing network was applied to human society in the um, the late 20th century. Um, and in this one, he sort of investigates the actual underlying ideas and where all those kind of ideas came from. And it turns out that it sort of originates with um, a combination of ecology and cybernetics. And, um, you know, at the heart of it all, it turns out that the entire idea is actually kind of bullshit. The idea of the self-stabilizing systems that um, just, like, lead to perfect stability, um, which is kind of disappointing. Yes. But, you know, um, <laughs> yeah, because well, this, this is a big idea that's, like, been uh, been big in our culture for quite a while now. Um, and it turns out it's just all... Like like a lot of uh, Curtis's films, like I think I think for me a lot of Curtis's films are this kind of like catalog of human folly, and uh, that's especially true for this episode. Yeah, absolutely. Um, he he calls uh, these self balancing systems a dream of the machines, mm, yeah, uh, yeah. but uh, certainly also a dream of uh, a dream of people. <laughs> yeah, it's. Um... And so, like, the, the, the kind of opening scroll, um, as is this text over it, which uh, introduces the, the film as, this is a story about the rise of the machines and our belief in the balance of nature and how the idea of the ecosystem was uh, invented, how it inspired us and how it wasn't even true. Um, and in the kind of, in the opening, like, um, Curtis does sort of talk about this idea of um, self-organizing networks um, as being a sort of machine dream that reflects how machines are organized, uh, but that doesn't actually reflect the underlying nature. Yeah, and that's a direct quote of uh, uh, Philip Murawski's book, Machine Dreams. Mm. We need to get <laughs> Which on is Murawski a, pretty soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm sure it was a big... Uh, he doesn't talk as much about ecology in his books, but uh, I'm sure it was still background reading for, for this episode. And I think it, it starts with, like, a kind of video of, like, a telepresence kind of, uh, like, networked text and video session that was... Uh... I think that's... Um... I think that's the, uh, the the session that's referred to as the mother of all demos, which was led by Douglas Engelbart in... 67 i think or or something like that it's kind of legendary in computing um as being this like early demonstration of like networked computing and like uh i think engelbart demoed stuff like yeah telepresence like basically skype in the 60s um and like screen sharing and like the guy in the remote facility was able to control his mouse pointer and all that sort of stuff um the, the, yeah, the, the, the it kind of... seems like they were, like, talking about ML or something like that. Um, mm. Yeah. It's, <laughs> I don't um, know. <laughs> it's a pretty incredible demo, actually. Um, it's it's definitely worth watch. But, like, yeah, in, in this episode, those the bits of footage from the Mother of All demos are kind of spliced in. And it's, like, it's it's meant to look kind of scary and weird. And, like, it's a bit of a thing in this episode that, like, uh, Curtis does crank up the scare quite a bit when kind of discussing cybernetics. Um, yeah, the sort of musical stabs and uh, mm. ominous uh, use of like slow down and stuff like that, uh, <laughs> which is which is sort of endearing. Uh, in that, I think like it, it's ob it's it's obviously like because um, it's putting on a show for like um, a general audience and doing it in one hour. But the I think for me the, the takeaway from this is that like. I mean, so, like, cybernetics is full of some pretty pretty awesome ideas, and, like, a lot of stuff in the world is systems. But those ideas were misapplied to uh, studies of nature and to systems which are, frankly, far too complex to be modeled in this kind of way. Um, and it's the misapplication that's the mistake rather than the kind of, like, underlying, um, the underlying theory. 
Um, right. But yeah, and we, we, we start down that road in, um, in Britain just after the end of World War I with this biologist, Arthur Tansley, who has a dream of a, uh, an African village and uh, something about his wife trying to shoot him or whatever. Um, he wonders what all this is about, and he sort of um, goes to visit uh, Sigmund Freud in Vienna to kind of seek therapy about this. And he was introduced to this uh, a kind of a, an, a, an obscure idea of Freud's that the brain was in fact an electronic machine or an electrical machine. Um, yeah, it, it's it's quite interesting because um, <clears throat> he calls it a, an obscure idea of Freud, but I suppose it is obscure in the sense that that's not what most people know Freud for. But actually, before he developed the theory of psychoanalysis, Freud was primarily interested in this idea of um, the connection between sort of like the mind and electrical impulses. That was like his main area of research that he was doing. And he sort of gave up on it and then went on to do psychoanalysis. But uh, Tansley picked up that earlier thread of research. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so like the, the, the core idea here is that to, to model the mind as uh, data input and energy running around networks, um, which I mean, like if you squinted it as a sort of, uh, similarity to what our kind of understanding of uh, neurology actually is, um, but again, this sort of theme where the like uh, these these like highly simplified models that were like inspired by um, the technology around them at the time, these kind of like electrical machines uh, aren't aren't actually excellent fits for the the kind of reality. Um, but Tansley then applies this model um, of the the brain as an electrical machine to the entirety of the natural world. Um, and he was convinced that beneath nature there was this like um, network of circuits and like energy moving around those circuits. And so he kind of like thought of plants and animals as being nodes and like the connections between them and energy flowing around the system. And to describe this, he like he creates the term ecosystems uh, to to kind of like this. This is the this is the root of the idea of these ecosystems. Um, and yeah, it's all very kind of mechanical. It's all like signals and nodes and systems and networks and um, and energy flows, uh, which is kind of odd, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, no, it's it's a, quite an incredible uh, metaphorical leap in thinking um, to look at the natural world um, and to see in it a. Uh, a system of uh, energetic circuits um, where uh, for most of us we see rather different things um, I suppose we've come to take Tansley's point of view in a lot of ways uh, but um, uh, it is it is really quite a tremendous uh, leap of thinking and um, and and I, I believe he also introduced the idea that the the ecosystem tends towards balance yeah um, yeah and th this seems yeah. to be just something he just believed and like he he cut this idea from whole cloth um yeah that like when when these systems are disturbed they supposedly uh tend back towards an original balanced state um and it's kind of it's it's not like historically it's not surprising that this guy came out of the the peak of the british empire is it like this kind of um belief in the kind of stability and and permanence of the of the original uh stable state you know yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, we'll we'll sort of get into it later in the episode, but uh, it it did sort of take on a explicitly imperialist uh, tone uh, when his ideas were later adopted by others. Um, and actually, during the same time that uh, Tansley was working on um, his ideas of the ecosystem, there was a, uh, a very famous uh, German biologist. Um, whose name was uh, Jakob von Uexkiel, uh, and uh, so apologies for my terrible pronunciation there, but uh, uh, he um, was an arch conservative um, politically, like an, an ultra reactionary. Um, but he came up with this idea of uh, Umwelt, uh, which essentially attempted to come up with a systems idea of the organism uh, within the sort of context it lived in. Um, uh, and so this idea 
um, actually ended up being quite influential on cybernetics as well, and it came from a similarly uh, very conservative um, political background because uh, what he was trying to do was to introduce um, <clears throat> this idea of reenchantment um, against uh, the sort of mechanistic uh, views of nature that were held by many on the left. Uh, he was trying to show how the organism was integrated into its environment, um, and therefore there was a kind of or organic wholeness to things. Um, later on, this would you know be taken in much more radical directions by other people, but it goes to show that there was a common... Um, there was a, a common political background to uh, a lot of these ideas about systems at this point in time. Um, and, uh, yeah, actually his ideas uh, ended up being quite influential on Heidegger. Uh, so from there went on to inter influence many, many others. Um, yeah, so he's kind of an, a, a very underappreciated figure, but was actually working at the same point in time. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's like this... There seems to be here like a, a strong desire for this to be true because it would kind of be useful. It's a useful idea to believe in this kind of stability, right? Um, in this kind of order. Yes. Yeah, and I, I, I may be getting this wrong, but I believe he was like kind of like kicked off his land by Bolsheviks, which is why he was such an <laughs> extreme uh, anti-revolutionary. <laughs> he used to be like an aristocrat. Yeah, so it was, yeah. Uh, it's, it's really, really interesting. Um, but like this history, there. This is these these are sort of re recurring sort of uh, sort of themes throughout this film that like these kind of ideas do spring from, uh, do seem to like consistently spring from minds that like have a vested interest in kind of establishing that the world actually is ordered in this way. And there's a there's a quote here in in the film from that like. It was an idea that from the English countryside to the jungles of Africa, there was an underlying mechanism that regulated nature as if it were a machine. Yeah, just like the British Empire. Right. right. And if you happen to be on the right side of that status quo, it's like it's a great yeah. thing to believe in, right? Like they say, oh no, it's a totally valid reason why we're up here and you're down there. And it's, oh, it's all it's natural, you know? Um But and this 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 idea then is kind of augmented when the, the computer arrives on the scene and we start to start to mix these natural and mechanical ideas together even further. Um the, the next the next figure we're introduced to is Jay Forrester. Um, he was like an early innovator in in, uh, in computing, and uh, in the 1950s he had built the uh, United States or helped to build the United States Early Warning System, uh, the kind of global network of radar installations that was um, uh, built to kind of keep this stable balance in the Cold War standoff um, and uh, in, ensure this kind of stability in the world system. Yeah, and, and he's an interesting figure. He actually gets inter interviewed for the documentary. Um, uh, but uh, it's it's notable that he was uh, from MIT um, and uh, that there were a lot of ideas that were introduced at uh, in that sort of Cambridge milieu of, of thinking um, that actually came from uh, neoclassical economics and uh, that were also brought in by practitioners of neoclassical economics into the sort of um, nuclear calculus of the U.S. military that uh, Forrester was, you know, working to sort of um, enforce with the early warning system, right? This whole idea about an equilibrium between the nuclear arsenals of the United States and the Soviet Union um, was actually an idea that was significantly enforced by neoclassical economists um, who, you know, similarly came from a traumatic background, right? That the, they, uh, they, they came from, uh, oh, many of them came from Vienna where they, they'd kind of been kicked out of their country by a fascist uprising and the economic collapse of their country. So I feel like there's, although um, Curtis doesn't really talk about it very much, there's kind of like this common background of uh, of trauma inspiring these sorts of uh, desires for equilibrium or for stability. Oh yeah, absolutely. Like it's not it's not an accident that it was this 
this uh, era of history in which these kind of ideas really took off, um, having come off of the back of the uh, the, the c- catastrophes of the early early twentieth century. Um, and yeah, like it's it's like, but like those ideas cast such a long shadow on us even today that like it, it is so so easy to sympathize with that kind of position of like wanting that wanting desperately to believe that the world was in fact naturally stable and would tend towards a natural equilibrium if only it were left alone you know if if only people would get like and particularly like throughout this film it's particularly like politicians that are supposed to be the ones who are constantly interfering with the natural order of things and like if if only power would disengage and politics would go away then the uh, world system would just sort of naturally stabilize and, and become peaceful. And like, yeah, with, with the context of the trauma that these was looming so large in these people's imaginations and in that, that culture, like it's kind of easy to see, you know? Yeah. And I've, I've actually really seen this in conversation with uh, Americans um, recently where I, you know, I have conversations about the sort of topics that we talk uh, about on this show. Um, and, people are interested in in the ideas of sort of like post-capitalism or alternative social arrangements or that kind of thing um and i get get to talking to them and you know sometimes they'll come up with uh sort of technical fixes proposed technical fixes to the problems and and if i if i kind of bring up the question of politics like well um, you know, isn't it difficult to make technical fixes if you have a hostile regulatory environment or if they're just going to be, uh, you know, subverted or co-opted by the powerful? Um, a lot of the time people will sort of get to the point where <clears throat> they say, you know, maybe that's true, but I don't want to think about it because I think that the political world is so dysfunctional and corrupt that I don't even want to engage with it, right? Right. Um, and, and it's really easy to see how that line of thinking could lead to the desire for this sort of system that would work perfectly if only there wasn't, you know, this corrupting influence that interfered with it. Right. Yeah. And, um, um, I mean like spoilers for the end of the episode, but it turns out that that line of thinking doesn't work out either. Um, you know, um, (laughs) But like, so the, the novelty, one of the novel, novel components of Forrester's thinking was that uh, his computers could be used to model these um, systems and like specifically the feedback loops that he believed would, um, would be the explanation for how these systems would st- self-stabilize. Um, and like he, he sort of like in his, in his interview, he kind of like um, seems, to, seems to see like all of society and all of the world and just everything as these kind of systems of feedback loops. Um, he talks about like physical systems, electrical systems, social systems, and they're, they're all fundamentally networks of feedback loops. Um, and he, he sees human beings as nodes in these networks and like very much like without agency that like we are, we, we are nodes in networks that are wired up like a circuit diagram and like utterly powerless to kind of actually change the kind of like structure of the system. And the only thing that matters is the flow of energy through the system and how the kind of like equations work out. Yeah. And Forrester like very much explicitly says this in his interview with Curtis, right? He's, he's not beating around the bush. He's just like, oh, like people think they have agency, but they don't, right? Like it's, it's a very like sort of <laughs> cl- clear statement like, no, you're just implicated in the system and you don't have any agency yourself, right? It's a, it's a very sort of like, um, it's the same sort of worldview that uh, Foucault uh, tended towards, right? In uh, some of his uh, more pessimistic work. Mm. Um, yeah, the, uh, yeah. The, 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 the power relations uh, sort, of, sort of work. Um, yeah, and like this this is a kind of like a very, it's, it's a very, it's kind of unnerving really to watch him be sort of interviewed, but um, it's, this, this, this guy was like a, one of the, the sort of leading figures in this kind of new movement of cybernetics, which is, um, and this is the bit where, where Curtis kind of really turns up the, the dramatic droning music and the, the, the upsetting imagery on screen to uh, 
to, you know, to, in this kind of kitschy way to almost to kind of like make it seem really kind of evil. But like um, the way Curtis puts it is that like cybernetics was, um, you know, it, it saw everything as systems that were, would be governed and regulated by feedback, um, which is sort of true to an extent. But I think he sort of sells it a bit short in that like cybernetics has some really useful ideas about systems. Um but the the fundamental I think mistake that was made here was in the misapplication of those ideas because like all of, all of this stuff about mod, using computers to model these systems presumes that the systems are comprehensible, which the natural world isn't, and like human society isn't like it's uh, unbounded in its complexity. Um, so like I think I think it's it's important to kind of zone in on that as the kind of like fundamental mistake of this kind of like uh program the that yeah like there are systems in the world but like if you would need a computer larger than the universe to compute the universe as a system right like it's fundamentally misguided to try and model this right yes Um, that's that's that that is a, a computational fact um and uh the other sort of main issue here is that uh is the assumption of um a tendency towards equilibrium in these systems right um that i mean that that is a very like the idea of of feedback leading to equilibrium is a really interesting point and then like this idea that equilibrium is a good description of what we might call a healthy system um is also a very sort of like it's it's a hard point to question right because i mean one thing that um Murawski brings up in uh more heat than light is that these sort of scientific ideas these these kind of paradigms of of scientific thinking um they don't have a a unshakable theoretical basis within their own domain. But what they do is they find confirmation in other fields of research and other fields of thinking and other metaphors. So, for example, uh, systems theory, um, especially of this kind of uh, equilibrium-based type that we're talking about here, uh, it finds a lot of justification in certain types of views about the human body, right? Uh, we talk about balance. Um, you know, the, it applies to a certain intuition the, that we the have. Homeostasis uh, and that that sort of thing. Home, yes, um, and in turn, our view of the human body is altered by our understanding of systems theory, right? that we come to understand the body as a system, and then we understand systems as a body, right? And so there is a kind of horizontal justification that happens between different fields of inquiry. So it really takes some um, kind of like deep consideration and thinking um, and re-examining of things to, to look at something like the body and question whether the metaphor we're applying is actually appropriate right? yeah yeah definitely um, um and like it's it seems that like the kind of the from my sort of reading and i think it's interesting that like um curtis brings up uh norbert weiner and is like control and communication in the animal and the machine uh here as well because uh it does seem as if the idea of stability and equilibrium is introduced because it is useful for machine systems and then it is it is applied to natural systems, but without any real justification. So, like in in Weiner's uh, book, uh, one of his books, he um, uh, talks about like the example of like a gun turret, where you 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 need feedback in the kind of greasing mechanisms so that um, either the, the the gun needs to pivot at a certain rate, and if it if it, the grease freezes up, it's too slow. If it goes too fast, etc. But like the presumption there is that if the 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 terrace system needs to be in a state of equilibrium or in a state of um like it has to be a self-contained stable system because otherwise the gun either shakes itself apart or it fails to land its shots and it is entirely because 
that is useful to a machine system, that that stability is presumed to be desirable. But there's no reason to believe that's the case with nature or with human societies at all, because, like, those aren't the same system. That, like, it, it, it seems to be just a really fundamental kind of error of judgment to, to uh, transfer yeah. those ideas. Another sort of common reference is the the, the thermostat, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's another very common uh, example used in uh, equilibrium thinking, right? Uh, or in, in sorry, in uh, in cybernetic thinking as a very sort of simple cybernetic system that you can you can discuss. Uh, and I mean, it is it's true that these things have a mechanical basis. Um, I don't. One of the things that um, is uh, brought up a lot in uh, Andrew Pickering's uh, book, uh, "The Cybernetic Mind," um, is is that um, that wasn't sort of the exclusive interest of cybernetics, and he tries to kind of bring in like some alternatives to Weiner's way of thinking. Um, one of the really interesting ones uh, you see is. Um, uh, Stafford Beers, uh, one of his early computational uh, projects was to try to make a computer out of a pond. Mm. <laughs> that does sound fun. <laughs> so he was literally creating, like he was trying to create a local ecology that could interact with some lamps uh, in such a way that it would do computational work, um, it, which is, is like an incredibly bizarre uh, idea. But um, at the time that he was working, um, the like electronic computers were not very reliable. And so it wasn't at all clear at that point in time that electronic computing would be the best way to do computing. Um, and so he was making this like very radical experiment that he was doing um, and, and, and actually trying to use an ecosystem as a computer. Um, it didn't work out because there was a lot that he wasn't able to control properly. Uh, but uh, it's, it's interesting when someone tries to think instead of, instead of trying to model the biological in a electronic computer uh, tries to take computing ideas and actually implement them in a biological form, <laughs> yeah. right? God, I wonder if you could run Doom on that pond. <laughs> mm. but I, yeah, I don't think so. I, I think the computational speed would be very slow, but I, 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 think that, I think that it may be a possible line for investigation um, of the sort of boundaries and limits of these metaphors to try to sort of do things the other way around, mm, right? Yeah. Oh, and, definitely. And yeah. see what happens there. Um, and, and, you know, maybe, maybe we will find that there isn't a lot of validity, but maybe we'll find something interesting. Mm, um, yeah. Well, especially like, um, uh, like nowadays, there's sort of more interest in, uh, um, like alternative computer architectures and such, and especially for the the AI stuff, but like kind of um, uh, the possibilities of like architectures that would actually mimic neural neural systems, like in the kind of literal sense, or like mimic biological systems, or even just like be biological computers. Um, is start is kind of like uh, those those are ideas that are constantly floating around in the background, and like whether that ever actually replaces the von Neumann architecture is uh, an open question, but that'd be pretty cool, right? Um, like bio chips yeah. and such. Yeah, I mean it, it's it's kind of interesting and in, in like you know if you have like a a robot controlled by a some kind of um, uh, biological brain and that kind of thing. That's that's kind of interesting, but it's also just interesting in a sort of way of exploring like what systems really mean, right? Um, yeah, because you know just taking the ideas and moving them away from um, the digital computer may reveal things that we hadn't previously anticipated about what systems are really like. 
because i mean a lot of what we see in this documentary is people modeling the world as circuit diagrams mm. oh yeah that, that's um and that that's the the next pair of guys we're introduced to is uh, howard and eugene odom who were ecologists that really applied these um cybernetic ideas to uh, the study of nature and they, they did it by building out like literal circuits like solder resistors capacitors on on like boards and stuff um to to mimic ecosystems um in electronic circuits which is really strange like seeing seeing the kind of diagrams for these things where like you have the symbol for a resistor and it's labeled fish and then there's a capacitor called birds and it's just whoa, it's really weird <laughs> right right um yeah and and uh and yet we do this all the time with software systems, right? <clears throat> um, it, it, it is, it's maybe a little bit more glaring um, when we look at it as a circuit board because the opposition between this electronic machine and what the parts of the machine are supposed to represent is so obvious. Uh, when we think about it in software terms, it's maybe a bit less obvious because we just see these disembodied words or icons that we've created in order to represent the things that we're modeling. Mm. Um, yeah. yeah, and it's, this is like, this is really weird stuff, right? Where like these these two guys are like um, traveling the world, collecting data and trying to model these kind of like natural systems and like like desperately trying to apply these ideas to nature. And it kind of turns out that what they're effectively doing is just distorting the scientific method to the point of fraud, really, that like they're simplifying the data and simplifying the models down to the point where they're actually just ludicrous. Like it, it frankly doesn't reflect anything in the things they've observed. They're just moving data around until it fits the kind of fantasy that they had created. There's actually there's a quote even from one of Odom's assistants that what they were really doing was uh, creating a machine-like fantasy of stability. And these guys were also obsessed with this, like, stability um, notion. Um, and they, they thought they could demonstrate it through these circuits, like, physical circuits that were, uh, you know, had circuits in which they had, like, resistors with the word fish scrawled on the side of them. <laughs> it's, like, actual insanity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, um, I mean, uh, it's kind of a thing that they seem to not really be able to test either, right? Like the like, it was sort of an assumption of the way that the natural world was that they'd inherited from Tansley, um, and like uh, one of the ecologists says in interview uh, in in this documentary, it was a it was a idea that attracted most ecologists to the field of ecology. And also one that was unquestioned. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It was presumed to be true. It was presumed that you could... Um, it was presumed that if you left nature alone, it would run like a well-oiled machine. That's, I think that's a, a, a quote directly from the guy. Um, and yeah, so like this this idea, this, this fusion of cybernetics and ecology kind of like... Um, emerges as like a science of its of its own um and also starts to suggest this uh an, an organizing principle for a human society um and it, like these kind of ideas starts to emerge of like a world um that would be built to mirror these supposed structures in nature and that would be free of the kind of like authoritarian uh, powers and old hierarchies and this is the, the callback to the first episode um this like idea of these like self-organizing networks being used as the template to build out the um, the new sort of economic order yeah it's it, it's like that idea like that these metaphors get laundered through different fields right that you, you you have this sort of psychological idea which becomes a ecological idea which becomes a computational idea which becomes an ecological idea which becomes a political yeah. idea it, um Ooh, and like none of it has any like, I mean, well, so, some of it is kind of rooted in, like, actual, like, thinking about systems and such. But, like, there's these, like, presumptions that underlie this whole thing. Like, the presumption of the stability thing has no evidence whatsoever to support it. 
and yet it is taken as an article of faith. And that, that like, it brings, uh, there's, there's a rather nice title card at this point in the film, um, the Operating Manual for Spaceship Earth. This is where we start to see these ideas be applied to human society. Um, and we, we get introduced to Buckminster Fuller, um, who had uh, also worked on the uh, early warning system, but he'd, he'd done that by inventing the geodesic dome, which would be that the housing for these uh, these radar installations. And these are these are you know, everyone's seen them. They look like huge golf balls. Um, but the kind of the key the key idea here is that these are structures made of very delicate components that are incredibly resilient when they're combined as a network. Essentially, that like I mean they're they're literally a network of nodes and edges, right? Like it's it, it's a very transparent sort of analogy. Um, but like Fuller also believed that this this could these these ideas could be used to create new systems for managing society. Yeah, um, and that to do this, like to kind of you would need to have this like perceptual shift for uh, the people of the world, and they would need to stop seeing themselves as like individuals and see themselves instead as equal nodes in this world-spanning network. Um, and like that, that that membership in the network in this in the system would would be more important than their membership in say nations or classes or races or what have you. Right. Yes. He he uh, developed this uh, metaphor of spaceship Earth. Um, you know, sort of using that famous image uh, taken from space of of the Earth as a round object right that that is a a small round object enclosed in space um and and instead of you know it, it was taken from a spaceship but he made the logical leap of saying well actually aren't we ourselves on a spaceship um and 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 the point there was to close and um shrink the sort of uh mental horizon of individuals right the, the, that they would kind of come to understand the finitude or like the limitations of living on this small object instead of what our normal experience of the world would be which is you know if you are traveling sort of horizontally around the world um it's kind of infinite in a way right um, you can keep traveling around it forever. Um, but, and like, you know, our, our, our vision of the horizon, um, it seems to go on forever. But if you take a look at the earth from the outside, then you see it as a encircled and closed object. Um, and even his, um, even his idea, like even that idea was informed by the the spacecraft that took the picture as well the like the uh the nasa sort of systems where the, the, the those like space missions were enclosed systems which were con were controlled by computers on the ground right like this is all it's all so directly inspired by the space program and the the, the kind of the, the the idea that emerges from this is the centering of the welfare of the overall system that like because like for for the for the space shuttles um or for the you know, space stations um you know like you obviously need to keep those in a kind of like closed equilibrium or else they shatter and everyone splatters out into space um but th that idea was then transferred onto the earth um as a kind of and like it, it you can start even to see here the beginnings of this as a, explicitly about control um political control but like kind of ironically they're He's also kind of putting out this idea that like uh, politics and politicians are the ones standing in the way of this like unified global system, and that if only politics would disengage and politicians would go away, then the natural stabilizing force of the feedback loops would create this kind of um, stable world without a need for power or control. Yeah, so he's he's emphasizing the importance of interconnection, right? So as as the systems on a spaceship function together, so should the systems on Earth function together. Um, but it like takes away that idea of uh, top down control. Yeah, yeah. And um, these ideas started to actually count, catch on with the the counterculture, and you got these kind of like 
uh, kids leaving the cities to go out and build these communes in the middle of the desert, which were modeled on all these kind of ideas with, a uh, you know, self-contained and self-sustaining communities with, uh, with no hierarchy where everyone is a node in a network that, um, will stabilize itself. Um, and yeah, they, they even built the, the geodesic they domes. They actually yeah. built a whole bunch of geodesic domes in these communes in order to sort of represent the ideal that uh, they were shooting for. Yeah, I mean, they look they look way cool, but um, I just I remember yeah. see, when, when you see them, it's like God, I I, I bet those leak like hell because like they were all made of like uh, reclaimed parts of cars and like glass panels and stuff, and I was like, oh, that can't possibly be weathertight. Um, <laughs> we, we do get some like interviews with uh, people who were like proud of these um, these communes, and um, the kind of like, this, the, the the phrasing is interesting. It's like this kind of talk of the organism of many who act as one, um, and that like it would be this like self organizing system where people are like constantly affecting each other at all times. But like they also have this kind of thing of like explicitly forbidding politics. Um, this starts to become like real concrete policy that like there can't be, which is, which is basically forbidding solidarity of any kind. Like you're, you're supposed to always behave like an individual node and the, uh, the, the, the being of the group is supposed to be an emergent property that just naturally arises from all those interactions. Um, but in any kind of like, um, I don't, I don't know, like buddiness or like, um, you know, reinforcement or anything that would be taken to be the development of cliques or of um, of political groups was uh, completely forbidden. Yes. Um, I guess the idea was that um, if you look at, say, a, uh, a geodesic dome, um, each point has its interconnections, but every point is equal. Uh, in significance uh, uh, in maintaining the structure of the dome, right? And they're um, all um, they're all like equally distant from their immediate neighbors, and the same radiating outwards. Um, and no no two points are ever allowed to actually touch. Um, so yeah, they, they, people took this idea and really really ran with it. And there's there's an interesting kind of circle here where uh, we begin with these sort of like ideas being extracted from nature and from machines, and then being applied to uh, human society on a global scale and then being applied to human society on a like tribal scale. And then the Silicon Valley guys come along and they start to see these communes as a model for all of human society again. So it's kind of like a nice circular kind of thing going on there. Except the, the difference with the Silicon Valley guys is that they were uh, convinced that the development of personal computers and like network technologies would enable the kind of commune uh, experience to be scaled up to the entirety of, uh, of the world. Um, which is which is a lot of the stuff that came up in the previous episode, and this is kind of like also familiar from our, our talk about the Californian ideology. Um, and yeah, like I think this this is where it starts to strike home that um, these Silicon Valley ideas and these kind of ideas of like these networked societies being inherently kind of stable as an emergent property and such are you know it's it's based on bullshit, right? Like there's no good reason to believe that would be the case, um, except for these ideas being recycled through so many different fields that nobody seems to have a grip on where the ideas came from and they like i, I would i would wager that none of these people would have heard of arthur tansley right and they especially would never have heard of him just making up crap to fucking say oh yeah no totally nature systems stable nah absolutely stable definitely um they wouldn't have been aware of that they just take it on faith because i suppose they don't have a reason to think otherwise yeah, and I think the, that uh, Curtis actually interviewed Stuart Brand uh, for, and he was talking exactly about that idea of a self-correcting vast network. Um, and and I and we saw Brand in the previous episode, but that was young Brand <laughs> uh, in you know a '90s interview, and then uh, we got to see the the 2010s uh, uh, Brand there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Brand Brand talks about these like yeah net networks, net, free individuals network together, no no hierarchy or control, um, and this would all be self -st self stabilizing, and a natural order would emerge through feedback. Um, he he was involved in the commune movement, and he sort of like then got together with the computer guys um, to sort of uh, see this realized. 
Um, and I, I guess one one big point that sort of comes out of this is the the idea that uh, politics is unnatural. It, it is a kind of aberration that does not exist in the natural world, uh, which is a very strange idea. They've positioned their thing explicitly as being modeled on nature, right? That like, and this this is an appeal to authority in nature that. The, the system we're proposing is based on models of nature. Therefore, anything that stands against it, such as politics uh, or, you know, any, any force that might say, no, hang on, this is kind of silly, is, um, you know, kind of inherently wrong because it is unnatural. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great way to borrow some authority for your, your project, right? Just like claim that it's natural. Um, yeah. It's a trick as old as time. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Um, but then we, we get to the we get to the bit. Uh, it's kind of nineteen sixty seven, and this um, this guy Richard Browdigan uh, writes a poem called "All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace," um, which is this like one wonderfully weird sort of vision of a uh, a stable world of harmony with humans and animals and computers all living together in a in a meadow, which I'll, I will splice in right now. I like to think, and the sooner the better, of a cybernetic meadow where mammals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony like pure water touching clear sky. I like to think, right now please, of a cybernetic forest filled with pines and electronics where deer stole peacefully past computers as if they were flowers with spinning blossoms. I like to think it has to be of a cybernetic ecology where we are free of our labors and joined back to nature, returned to our mammal brothers and sisters, and all watched over by machines of loving grace. Um, but yeah, it's like really, I don't know, quite quite strange when it's um, when it's read out by Browdigan. Um, but it is this kind of like very epic sort of vision of. Uh, what would be a safe and stable world free of, like, um, the violence uh, that, that had haunted the kind of collective memory from the early part of the century, you know? Yeah. Um, I think it, it really gets back to sort of the ideas of utopian socialism, um, like of uh, Fourier uh, and, and this kind of um, perfect harmony. Right of, of of nature and humans and and of of thought um, and uh, yeah it, it, I mean it, it's it's a very compelling picture um, in a sense because um, I mean the, the poetry is actually pretty good um, yeah it's quite nice and it's, um... and, uh, it, and I, I really think that it's an excellent uh, summation of the sort of world that. Um, would later be uh, in, envisioned in uh, Ian Banks's culture series uh, as a kind of utopia of, you know, it says uh, mammals and computers live together in mutually programming harmony. Um, it's this kind of idea of sort of like interaction and equality um, uh, that uh, is is really quite nice, uh, but the issue is that it has a lot of sinister <laughs> sort of outcomes it really does um yeah it's like it's this is all like as as much as it's like again this this curtis stuff is like a, a whistle stop tour of human folly right um but i i would really like to want this right like that it, 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 i just imagine living in that time frame and believing this stuff like it must have yeah. felt good right <laughs> like, yes it must have felt a lot better than the kind of constant grinding anxiety that i i, I feel today right <laughs> yeah <laughs> right um, right um yeah and like wandering about in a meadow with deer and uh you know ibm mainframes and such that's yeah probably would have been quite nice um but yeah, the the next um, the next section of the film then is a, has this nice title card, the Doomsday Machine, um, and it kicks off with the kind of like the early the, when in the early nineteen seventies when we're starting to get like constant clear evidence though, of a global environmental crisis, um, and this was this was a pretty pretty bad time, you know, it was like 
mounting evidence that there was really bad stuff coming down the pipe and like nobody seemed to have any idea what to do about it uh except for our boy Forrester who um his solution was hey I got this huge computer here let me build a model of the world and the ecological the the world sort of um ecosystem uh and model it out for you um and he does and his his team do it um and the model predicts imminent catastrophe um, yeah, this is the famous Club of Rome, uh, mm, and the, the their their limits and, to growth paper and uh, their conference yes. uh, along the same lines. Um, but yeah, the model showed that within decades, the human or the, the the human population of the world would overshoot its carrying capacity, and uh, you get to collapse, a massive decline in standards of living, et cetera, et cetera. You're, we're all kind of familiar with that sort of stuff by now. Um, yeah, it's a kind of neo neo Malthusianism. Mm, uh, yeah, very much so. Um, and this 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 then starts to go really onto the world stage, right? Like they've got the attention of uh, the UN. Uh, every government in the world is kind of like hanging hanging on this kind of like thing now. Um, there's actually kind of um, there's a great sort of bit of footage from. Um, Oh, some some huge sort of gathering and um, and uh, where very serious people gather to discuss these sorts of things. And there's a there's a lady speaking, and she's kind of saying that you cannot run a global society on the totally irresponsible sovereignty of 120 distinct governments. Um, and it's 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 not. I don't think it's an accident that it's the lady with the posh English voice that's saying this, right? Like, um, and the, that, that's the the picture that starts to emerge here is that like. This is kind of a power play in a way that like um, because the, the, the proposition that the that Forrester and the Club of Rome are bringing to the table is that we must give up on continual growth and instead create a stable, steady state for the world. And we've also got to stop trying to change the world and that the role of politics should instead be to hold the existing system in equilibrium. Um, and that, like, unsurprisingly privileges whoever happens to be in power at the time right like is this right it's it's very much like the um the same sort of thinking that was happening in economics at this time with the decisions to uh assign greater authority to central banks uh apart from uh political authority so, like, to, to create independent central banks and to enforce um, central banking policies that m reduced and limited inflation, right? Um, so there was a really concerted attempt sort of across the board to impose stability on society. Um, and uh, th that took a sort of ecological angle with the Club of Rome, and then in terms of um, uh, economics, it also took a kind of, like, fiscal angle, where, you know, working-class people were basically given a really hard time uh, by the central banking policies that were taken at this point, um, and, and you know, really kind of suffered, um, and, and really has, have never recovered. We have never recovered from the decisions that were made at that time. Um, and uh, it was exactly, as you say, a, a kind of power play. Mm, yeah, there's this, there's a kind of a deep irony to this as well, that like the equilibrium cultists are kind of willing to inflict like truly radical change on people in the name of stability, right? That like they're, they're constantly crowing about stability and preservation and this kind of essential conservatism, whilst like frenzied hacking at the kind of people and institutions around them, right? Like it's kind of weird <laughs> how, the, how they kind of do this, right? That like, um, yeah, I mean, it it is the same kind of thinking that is behind like austerity politics, right? right? Yeah, that's that's exactly it, right? That like, I mean, yeah, like people will introduce like absolutely crazy new policies in the name of that kind of like conservation and austerity while it's, yeah, it's, it's mad. Um, but like the kind of, the thing that's notable here is the kind of absence of the possibility for change, right? Like the entrenched powers here are 
kind of holding the world hostage with the threat of catastrophe. And they offer exactly two options. Either stabilize the system as it is right now or die. Though, and the there's there's no room at all for change or adaptation. And like so Curtis gives a little bit of room here to like saying that the ecological movement was hijacked by the by these people. Um and he gives a little bit of airtime to the kind of the other side of the ecological uh, movement that was saying that yeah, this was uh, being used not to save the world, but to dominate it and to impose uh, control on behalf of the existing kind of um, kind of power blocks. Um, I would I would really like to have a bit more of that in this film. Uh, I think there are scenes later that could have been lost in order to give um, this speaker here a little bit more time, because other without that, you kind of get the impression that this is just an attack on the notion of uh, e ecological consciousness or, like, the notion of, like, combating climate change at all. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, it, it is... It is um, the presentation given here is very much in agreement with the sort of um, right-wing nativist uh, critique, right? That, like, uh, you know the globalists are creating one world government and are using scientific ideas to um, dupe everybody into following their control, right? Like, this is it pretty much exactly how a lot of um, right-wing uh, thinkers uh, mm -hmm. present things, right? And it, it would be nice to have it kind of underscored a bit uh, more that this was one part of the kind of um, response to the ecological crisis that like the, the club of Rome didn't in fact represent the entirety of the kind of ecological movement but this this was a vision that became kind of mainstream right this was a um, I think there's a kind of a there's, there's a quote here that like it was a machine vision of the world which could not imagine a future in which human beings unlike machines would behave in ways that they hadn't before so, like the the possibility of changing the system, because you know, you, you got to understand these these people can conceptualize the world as a fixed system, a rigid system, like a, a a system in which all the nodes were already wired up, and their models didn't include any possibility of change. Um, the the model was presumed to exactly replicate reality as it was, and that that reality would remain static forever. Um, well, I mean, I mean the, 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 the Club of Rome model was, it was designed to project into the future a, a continuation of present trends, right? And, and then to, to see what the consequences were. The, the issue was that um, it couldn't account for uh, changes in the assumptions of the model, Right. Um, so that there, there could be a fundamental change to the way things were organized. Um, it, it proposed as a result a certain course of action, which was to basically just sort of like trim off those factors that were leading towards the collapse scenario. Right. Um, and to impose that uh, model the revised model mm -hmm. on reality. Yeah, I mean, it, it would have been a pretty... And it's it's a pretty brutal sort of program of austerity that, like, preserves all the power as it is, you know, and, like, uh, yeah, it's kind of kind of mad. But, like, this this thinking still infects our, our thinking about climate change even today, right? That, like, there's still the kind of, like, uh, false kind of split between, on one hand, continuing on the trajectory we have into disaster or going to zero with like essentially a, a going back to some kind of primitivism um but that the the possibility of changing the trajectory by like fundamentally altering what we do and how we relate to nature is is still persistently off the table and i kind of like wonder if this club of rome stuff really just set the tone um in a really disastrous kind of way uh, yeah, I, I think that's that's quite accurate, and and you even see quite a few people um, on the left who uh, 
who sort of presents socialism as a more coherent mechanism for uh, implementing the kind of steady state um, system that the uh, Club of Rome originally put on the table. Um, and I, I know that's that's been an idea that um, has certainly been uh, compelling to many, including uh, myself when I was younger, um, of like, you know, being brought up uh, constantly sort of hearing the sort of language and recommendations that were that came out of this period that came out of the club of rome's recommendations and the sort of popularization of the limits to growth the 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 concern about um impending ecological catastrophe the desire to create stability all those things were part of like you know our education growing up um and and uh you know we also saw again and again that governments failed to do anything about the issue right um we saw that uh you know the kyoto protocol didn't really mean anything and then the next thing failed the next thing failed the next thing failed um and 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 radical change radical socialist change uh was a attractive as a kind of like well let's do something about it right uh, the the issue is that we have like and I mean that's even a thing that we we talked about quite a bit in our four futures episode to begin with right um, I think that um, the issue is that we we have to be very careful about our thinking uh, so that we do not simply impose a kind of left wing austerity because uh you know, we saw what happened in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis when, say, um, the Social Democratic parties of Europe uh, were elected and decided to impose a austerity program in accordance with uh, the recommendations of, of, of financial experts, right? Um, we can't do the same thing to the entire world on an ecological ground that we did on a financial ground, right? Like, we can't take that road that is not a road that leads to any kind of um, positive uh, socialist organization. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Yeah, it's like, I think we, it's, it's, I think it's becoming clearer to me that, like, our our very way of thinking about a lot of these problems has been infected by really weird sort of presumptions and like kind of like incorrect ways of even considering the problem and that we've also pruned away a lot of possibilities for like meaningful change um or even even like um like I think one example is that even when we talk about renewable energy, we still think about it in terms of our kind of petro culture, in which energy is both toxic and scarce. Even people who are deeply invested in kind of like um, renewable energy and such still carry that baggage. Their entire concept of energy is still tainted by our present understanding of it, right? Like, um, and that's. We, I think it's like we desperately need to move beyond these sorts of modes of thinking and start to really consider what uh, change and adaptation really looks like, um, where we, we choose neither to go, uh, you know, primitivist and like collapse back to a pre-industrial society, nor do we choose to uh, desperately claw at stabilizing the current system but like actually depart from this trajectory entirely and like think about what 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 a future looks like when we uh l learn to live in nature and in ourselves in that kind of way but yeah like it's 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 really it's really glaring to see this like in such stark kind of relief that like these ideas have concrete roots um and were kind of like popularized by specific groups and people and have like a specific lineage that leads back to a specifically rotten uh, idea at its heart that that didn't have any evidence to support it. Right? It's um, 
it's crazy that we still we're still on this trajectory <laughs> yeah and i mean i mean i think that's really the thing you get from studying the history of ideas from like historicizing ideas um is you get i mean it was kind of the thing that I was mainly focused on in grad school. And there's definitely a sense of, um, of intellectual vertigo you get by going back and seeing the origins of the idea of the things that you take for granted and how there used to be a lot more uncertainty about these concepts. Um, and there used to be a lot more sort of, um, personal and political stakes, um, in the creation of these concepts than you take for granted um, in what you've been taught. Uh, and uh, it, it is a quite a um, quite an unnerving experience, you know. Um, it, it, it is really something um, that uh, is, is kind of akin to sort of like, you know, like Lovecraftian horror, right? Yeah, um, yeah. The sort of horror of knowledge, right? Um, not in that like you know things, but that you you see the sort of abyss of uh, endless recursion, right? Like or en en endless regression. Um, uh, what you know, like it, it's sort of that uh, Hegelian bad infinity experience. It just goes back forever and ever and ever and ever. But um, I mean, I think what I've found in my personal life experience. Uh, having you know spent years doing that stuff and, and sort of like getting very upset by all of it <laughs> um, <laughs> is you need to kind of uh, I guess you you need to not lose yourself in the the sort of perspective that history gives you history of ideas gives you specifically right that like that these ideas are just sort of untethered things um uh, if you can try to sort of connect it or associate it to the world you live in um, outside of just thinking about which idea led to the other idea, um, then you can start to maybe uh, create something out of it instead of just getting lost in its endless depth. Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Like... um like it's it's so it it it's so kind of like interesting and enlightening to kind of like realize that like a lot of stuff that we take as articles of faith are a lot of those ideas are actually historically contingent right like that they are from specific places and times and were formed under specific pressures and it's kind of like easier to then recognize that like oh well this 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 seems like a really bad idea now but like it's understandable given the kind of like immediately preceding sort of list of ideas that came before it and how like I ideas are sort of like you can only really move from one idea into one that's ad adjacent to it there's never really massive conceptual kind of like quantum leaps forward it's always this movement from the the currently known into the kind of adjacent space beside it and that like you're always kind of moving it a little bit forward at a time um and yeah, you can take you can take kind of solace in that that like well yeah we we are in in a way haunted by a lot of really stupid ideas but like they happened for reasons and like which also means that like the ideas we form now will happen for reasons right yeah it's it's what is really disturbing though is when you um, you enter into that truly sort of re reflexive point of view where you are studying the history of ideas but then you're using ideas to study the history of ideas so there like there is no there's no foundation right it's it's just um like endless recursion you know it's enough to drive one mad yeah 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 that's that's <laughs> that like i think that's where you sort of get that kind of like love lovecraftian cosmic horror um, which is that it's like, oh, like, there's no foundation to any of this. Um, and, and the foundation that we have is only a part of this, uh, this recursive process, uh, reflexive process. Um, and, and, you know, it's, it's kind of like, 
it's like Neurath's ship, right? Like, you just, you build it as you go along, and um, you're kind of deconstructing it at the same moment that you are constructing it into the new form you need. Um, uh, and, and I, like, I mean, my, my personal experience was that, like, I really needed to get out of my head, uh, in, in, in just sort of, like, doing that continuous, um, recursive analysis of, of the history of ideas, and, like, because it's like you study the history of ideas, and then you re-examine your own ideas, and then based on your re-examination, you re-examine the history, and then you re-examine your own ideas. <laughs> and so it's a kind of an endless process, right? Mm. Which is not necessarily a bad thing, but I feel like if you, if your approach to the world becomes overly intellectualized, it is terrifying because you sort of shut out the rest of your experience of life. And I and I think that's kind of the danger with um, you know something like this idea of the ecosystem as a energetic uh, system of circuits, right? That yes, that is a way to view the ecosystem, but there are many other ways to experience the world around you, and you shouldn't discount them just because you have a viable reduction of your experience to a functional metaphor or a metaphor that is functional in some sense. Um, yeah. Yeah, certainly. And like kind of playing off of that idea, the, the, the history of ideas as well, that like the, the next, the next part of the kind of film is that pointing out that, well, all of this stuff that uh, Forrester and the Club of Rome were up to had already happened kind of 30 years before. Um, with this, this guy, Phil Marshall Smuts, who uh, Tansley accused of uh, kind of abusing his ideas of, um, of these kind of ecological concepts. And uh, Smuts was, was responsible for this idea of holism, the notion of the, the world as one gigantic organic system in which, and this is the important part, in which everything had its proper place. Um, and that this system would be stable so long as everything and everyone remained in their proper place. Um, so yeah, the guy, the guy was like an inveterate racist and scumbag um, who basically wanted to see the structure of the British Empire be reflected in the entire world. Um, and this like holistic system, this world system would be managed, of course, by uh, white Europeans, um, which is like a truly disgusting sort of vision of the world, which like like really fetishizes this equilibrium and stability stuff to the, to the, the, its highest possible sort of way, you know? Um, yeah. Some sort of ideas that tans may have been sort of implicit in, in Tansley are, are very explicit in smuts and, uh, and, and Tansley actually got angry at, at, uh, at smuts. Right. And yeah, he gives us the, the, the title. He, he accuses smuts of the use of the abuse of vegetational concepts. Um, but yeah, I mean, like 40 years later, Forrester was doing the same thing, um, uh, like, you know, insisting that this the world should be a stable system in which everything had its place um, and that that should be then cemented in place forever as the the one and only way that the, the world could be run. And this this but this catches on. Right. This really. And like over the course of the 70s, you get this like. Uh, you know, the popular consciousness starts to get these ideas of like spaceship earth, the web of life, one world, one people, we've got to manage the world as a single system. And it's, it's all, it's all powerful stuff because it seems to be apolitical and scientific. Um, and that like this, this is, this is good because politics isn't involved and it's got a scientific basis, except in the seventies, the scientific basis crumbled entirely. Uh, when a new generation of ecologists started finding evidence that actually, no, these natural systems don't, in fact, tend towards a natural stability. They actually tend towards wild and violent swings and oscillations. Um, constant, dynamic, unpredictable change turns out to be the actual nature of nature rather than, you know, stability. Um, and this, this upset a lot of people. Um, yeah, of course, it was it was a scandal. Uh, in in the ecological world, um, and uh, I mean it, it. It makes me think a lot of um, like there's a. I live next to the uh, 
the Kamo River here in Kyoto. Um, and the river has been um, channeled into, uh, you know, very clearly defined uh, path. Um, and and, and the, the, the bed of the river has been... Uh, like highly developed uh, through the use of sort of like um, earth moving uh, and, and 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 introduction of, of of different sort of like stages and and like uh, waterfalls and and you know just an utterly artificial channeling of, of the river uh, in a way that is still functional for the uh wildlife that lives in it you know like there's still birds that live there is still fish that live there it's not like one of those like straight uh channels like you see in la but uh it's also been beautified a lot right that it's also been given a huge number of like trees that are uh, uh along the banks and it, it's it's a very very uh, beautiful place um, and it even uses a lot of the sort of surrounding hills scenery uh, to kind of create this this illusion of when you're in the the, the trails along the side of the river that that the city does is sort of hidden from your view and you can just see the natural world around you. Um, but whenever people go there, they always talk about like, oh, isn't it so nice to be in a natural space? But this is, it is an, is an utterly artificial uh, construction. And every year, the amount of work that is required to maintain the path of the river in terms of, like, bringing in heavy, uh, like, uh, earth movers and, uh, like, you know, just doing tons of dredging work and landscaping uh, just to maintain this, this picture of what the river ought to look like it's enormous right um and uh and yet we we call it natural because it is pleasant mm -hmm. yeah it's <laughs> you um, know <laughs> because like if they stopped doing all that kind of earth moving this um it would that the, the river would not maintain a stable state it would in fact just like vary wildly um, yeah, like the, the, the amount of silt that would come down from the mountains would overwhelm the banks of the river and it would flood and then the river course would change. Yeah, right? yeah. And um, this is this is the stuff that these um, this new generation of ecologists started to discover. And like they would um, I, I think a, a part of it is going to be that they had better techniques for capturing and recording data. And like also they weren't like the Odom brothers actually falsifying the damn data in the first place. Um, but they would study things like, you know, moose and wolves uh, populations on remote islands and find that what the their existing dogma told them that uh the moose and wolf population would stay in a kind of like stable equilibrium you know feeding off each other uh but what they actually saw was these like constant swings from uh feast to famine for the for the wolves that like wild oscillations in population um and the same was true in the soil record and the vegetation and even things like the presumption that like fires and floods would be followed by a return to stability, even those weren't true. That like actually every time a fire goes through a forest, it resets it to zero and then a brand new ecology emerges and it doesn't re return to the previous pattern at all. Um, the, the, there was a lot of um, ideas about uh, stages of maturity in ecosystems um, that you would have, like, you know, a fire come in, and then there would be, like, an early stage of, of growth, then that would be su succeeded by a moderate stage, and then there would be a mature stage, and then there may, might be a fire again that would bring it back to the, the first stage. But actually, that, that cycle isn't nearly as smooth or neat as you might expect, and the the kind of vegetation you're like yes there are certain kinds of vegetation that come in after a fire and thrive but the path that that takes is not set towards a certain image of what a mature ecosystem looks like yeah yeah it's it's different every time um and these these ecosystems recombine in, in crazy new ways after each disturbance um so like there, there was no stable underlying pattern. And we see this um, really come to a head with 
uh, one George Van Dyne and his sort of experiments out in the grasslands. Um, you've got this really, really kind of wonderful sort of footage of um, these dorks following deer around in the middle of uh, this, these these grasslands and like watching them eat and then recording on a tape recorder is like one bite of of whatever kind of grass. Um, data collection, like really going crazy on the data collection and the modeling. Um, they were following these things all over the place. They were um, taking measurements all over the uh, the ecosystem and feeding it all into a huge computer. But when they ran the model, it showed no stable underlying pattern. Instead, the model refused to settle down into a stable pattern. It instead varied wildly and it, it wandered all over the place. Um, very dynamic. And the thing was that like they were they were gathering data that actually reflect reflected reality now. And the model was starting to reflect reality. Um, mm -hmm. It was just becoming noise, right? Um, like there was an assumption that the more data you fed into the computer, the closer it would get to a kind of stable pattern. Yeah, uh, and, and it but didn't. that didn't happen. Yeah, right. It, it got further and further from stability. In fact, the more data they got, um, so like all the ideas that underlaid all this stuff turned out to be complete fucking nonsense. Um, which isn't surprising when you consider that the Odin brothers were faking their fucking data anyway. Um, so, yeah, Jesus. But, like, by this stage, um, like, we, we now have the scientific evidence that, in fact, we do live in an extraordinarily dynamic world. And that, like, constant change is the actual nature of nature. But all these ideas have already caught on in the kind of, like, uh, social and political system. Yeah, they re they really die hard. Like you you hear that um, that old saw about the 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 wolves um, still, yeah. right? <laughs> you still, that like still like, an, an uh, like oh you know the wolves they just they just keep everything in order. But like it's not so simple, right? Um, yeah, it's yeah. no, it's it's madness. Um, and yeah, it's just this doesn't turn out to be a sound basis for organizing anything like it, na nature isn't organized this way right that these self-organizing feedback networks it's it, it just isn't and that's not a sound basis for organizing kind of human society in the way that these um, these people were trying to do um so the kind of one of the last things that uh, curtis covers before closing out is that like revisiting the communes and finding that they'd all failed as well um and this it's it's kind of like the failure is that like this in with the absence of explicit hierarchy, you would instead get the development of implicit hierarchy, which is actually much more dangerous, because it turns out that power is inescapable. And these, these communities devolved into just like savage bullying and uh, horrible, horrible sort of, um, you know, interpersonal dynamics. But because politics was forbidden, solidarity was also forbidden. So nobody could come to the defense of the victims of this bullying, right? Yes. Um, yeah, it's... Uh... Uh, it's sort of like problems problems with anarchism 101 right like the um, the obsession with horizontality um, and then the kind of like unwillingness to acknowledge that there are actually people in the community who are running things or who are more powerful than others uh, then taken to the extreme because they had this kind of um, what was it called the uh, uh, synergia synergia yeah so synergia was this um, commune where you could only have these one on one interactions right like that you would get together as a group but people would uh, interact with each other on a one to one level like they have that uh they have that footage of the two people sort of um, watching each other and yeah. moving and, yeah. and, and kind of interacting uh, in a way that, like, you might kind of expect to see in a sort of drama class or something mm. like that. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, it's either that or they're, like, sitting with, like, this circle of people around them with, with one person in the hot seat, which is just, like, looks so much like a trial, you know? Yeah, exactly. So it's like it's supposed to be like you are expressing yourself to the group um, or you are interacting on a one to one basis in front of the group. But what it doesn't take into account is like everybody's not the same and 
being exposed in front of a group can be uh, an empowering thing, but it can also be an extremely disempowering thing. Yeah, uh, like you know, the, the thing that the one of the members brings up specifically in her interview was that not everyone is as powerful in their own voice. Um, there's there's a natural disparity in people's like ability to assert themselves, and like kind of insisting on the flash structure um, really disadvantages people who aren't boisterous kind of fucking know it alls. Um, and, you know, leaves them to fend for themselves, essentially, in an implicitly, in, in a social environment that's like, doesn't have an explicit map to it. It's all kind of implicit and shifting. Um, and like, yeah, these natural, natural sort of dynamics form. Um, and because the group doesn't have a hierarchy that can, or beca because the group doesn't have a structure that can counteract these forces, well, then everyone's at the mercy of these, like, uh, dynamically emerging kind of horrors. Yeah, and I mean, I I don't know how much it's a it's a question of nature, but it is it is um it's a question of like what you bring to the community, right? Um, and like you know, there's there's uh there's there's gender roles, there's differing levels of education and and different kinds of socialization. Um, you know, there's this sort of like. Uh, differing personalities. Um, it could be very like, yeah. I remember like one time um, I was in a seminar with someone, uh, and they they said something uh, that I that I didn't agree with, and and I got very upset, and I uh, I sort of uh, called them out in a very like aggressive way on it, um, and they actually ended up fainting. Uh, because I was <laughs> I was attacking them, uh, and and yeah, and like what the reaction of the group was was to sort of like you know gather around the person and like help them up and and like are you okay and all that kind of thing, right? But if it's a one to one situation, um, like yeah, it would just be like, well, you know, like hey, that's a one to one re interaction, like. Mm you just got to speak up for yourself, right? Like, well, what if, you know, what if they can't, right? Uh, and, and, and so there's all kinds of sort of like, um, horizontal interactions or back channel interactions or like, you know, like the ability to fade into a group, um, uh, and feel, find comfort there that are all sort of banned in that kind of uh, very, like, rigid social structure that they devised. Um, and, and, you know, we, we see it absolutely in, um, in, a, in a number of situ social situations, but uh, I think that we see these kinds of problems to some extent with the amount of social dysfunction we find online uh, in, in uh, massively open platforms like Twitter. Um, uh, and I, and, and, and we've seen a recent trend, I think of, of a lot of people retreating to, um, closed environments, uh, where they can feel a sense of, uh, uh, solidarity or, uh, acceptance from like-minded people. Or just, um, or just not being exposed to the fucking elements in the way that like tw Twitter for, for somebody who's, who's not the kind of like stalwart sort of uh white male who doesn't have much to fear right being on a wide open social platform must be like being clinging to the side of a fucking mountain in in a blizzard right like it's you know like it, it it's not surprising that there's a kind of retreat into kind of just like more pleasant spaces where they don't have that kind of expectation of harm um yeah and i mean it, for for a lot of people it does seem to have a kind of utopian dimension in the sense that, um, you know, Twitter has been a avenue for them to escape from their local communities they do live in, which are very uh, oppressive and, and hateful and discriminatory. Uh, but then they find themselves locked into that social network um, where, like, yes, I like the thing where I can find like-minded people on here. However... And like and like that is that is also like a lifeline for me 
as an individual and finding finding community but i also have to take the point of being exposed to constant attack from yeah. other people because like um, the thing being it like you can you can escape from the village asshole right but the thing is being on twitter brings you into contact with every village's asshole from all over the world and you're now exposed to this um wide open plain uh, with a blizzard sweeping across it that um there's no shelter <laughs> I think it's it's kind of a common thing with uh, what we what was what we saw with the communes was like a lot of the people who were choosing to drop out of society and go to these communes were people who were quite uh, vulnerable, um, right? Uh, who who didn't fit in, um, and uh, you know they did find a kind of attractive vision of life in the commune uh but they also uh oftentimes found themselves in a very de desperate situation um because of the rigid structures it had that weren't really able to deal with conflict in any kind of productive way mm. yeah and that that seems to be the kind of closing message there that these that the self-organizing model couldn't handle the kind of control dynamics that emerge in human societies and just like things like politics and power, which as, as, as much as the kind of, as much as they seem distasteful are just kind of part of being human as we know it for now, you know, um, uh, can't, can't really be gotten away from. And I think like, if you can't get away from it, you kind of need to lean into it instead. Cause like, um, these, these two films, at least in a row, have kind of presented a compelling argument that like ignoring power or like disavowing power is actually a pretty bad way of um of trying to organize a society yeah and the like it kind of closes out with like the, the hippies thought they were adopting the processes of nature but in fact they were really adopting a machine ideology um and that this this machine ideology has become the kind of dominant ideology of our age um and we we have started to kind of see ourselves as components in a system but seeing ourselves that way makes it really difficult to change the world, to change the system. Um, and it all, it kind of leaves us all feeling a bit kind of helpless in the force of, um, this, uh, this like seemingly quite rigid system and the forces that are powerful within it. Yeah. And I think he sort of closes up with the, the example of like the color revolutions, um, and how they didn't really go anywhere. Like the, it's like they took power, but then, they weren't really able to do anything with it because they felt powerless in the face of the system. Um, and it, it's, I don't know. I mean, it, 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 I guess it's an attempt to sort of be relevant by bringing up a recent example. Yeah. I'm convinced that's the only reason it's in there. Um, cause it's, yeah. it's a pretty good like, for the film. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, yes, they were failed revolutions to a large extent, However, the history of humanity is filled with failed revolutions, you know, Pretty like, <laughs> um, like revolutionaries taking power and then sort of like faffing about not really sure what to do is is absolutely something that happened in 1848, long before <laughs> the invention of the computer. Right. Yeah. Like uh, that is that is not a unique uh, or particularly cybernetic problem. It's something um, that, like, I think, I think Curtis is, Curtis closes out almost all of his films with this sort of um, bit at the end, like with the, uh, you know, current or recent instability uh, or folly. Um, so I think it's, it's a bit of a tick, you know. I think in his in his kind of filmmaking, um, and it, it it does seem to be just that that like kind of making some kind of contemporary reference um and also kind of shoring up his general thing about like the the world actually being a quite chaotic sort of place with nobody actually at the wheel um you know yeah and i, I think there's probably like stronger examples to point to as to like where this kind of problem has emerged like for example um i mean he could have possibly done it at uh, at the time, uh, because, you know, this happened afterwards, but, like, um, uh, 
you know, what happened with Syriza when they came to power and then were just, like, crushed, right? Like, it's... Or, or uh, what happened to the uh, Mitterrand government uh, in the 80s, right? Uh, like, where they were, like... They... I mean, that, that was, like, a really good example uh, because it was an example of a socialist party coming to power uh, with a lot of popular support in a wealthy country with a program of social transformation um, and just sort of like finding themselves kind of like overwhelmed by the financial system. Right. Um, and, 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 and not really being able to find a clear, um, a clear target to fight. Right. Like, I mean, even if you assume that Mitterrand had the best of intentions, which is questionable, um, what could, like, if he had appealed to the people for popular mobilization to protect the revolution, what what target would he direct them against, you know? Right. Like and, and I feel like the kind of systems thinking that Curtis is bringing up here is it does inform the sort of problems of that mode of politics. Right. So like we, we absolutely can look forward uh, to the potential election of a Corbyn government. Right. Which would be a very similar situation in some ways to the election of Mitterrand. Uh, you know, similarly, like a powerful country um, having a, a, a kind of like left leaning government elected with a kind of ambitious program of social dem democratic change. Um, and it's very easy to imagine them just being stymied completely by um, their inability to maintain any kind of coherent organization of society that is contrary to the way things are done, right? That, that, is, that is the way the system does things. Um, and that seems to be a much sort of like stronger issue to, to uh, address than the color revolutions, which were much more like liberal revolutions that were about kind of like national independence and... Um, uh, freedom from Russian interference and that kind of thing, um, and like and, and getting rid of corruption, which I don't think is really like, like getting rid of corruption is a a problem, but it's it's not a social transformation in the sense that um, an ambitious socialist program is. No, yeah, it's a it's a pretty low rung on the ladder, really. Yeah, um, so. I think that's a much sort of like stronger thing of saying we find ourselves disempowered by our belief in the omnipotence and sort of impersonal character of the system of control that we live in, the capitalist system of control, uh, which is based on these like networks of finance. Yeah. Um, um. So to try and kind of close out on a positive sort of note, like what 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 do we take from this um, as a sort of lesson to go forward? And like I think we were kind of talking about the, this in the green room a bit that like our kind of visions of utopia probably need to move away from this kind of static notion of stability and equilibrium and more towards sort of dynamic notions uh, that like actually reflect the kind of nature of nature and the kind of you know, human dynamics. Um, yeah, um, I, I think so. And, you know, it's, it's a pretty interesting uh, episode for me to watch because uh, uh, my father was an, a, a range ecologist um, and uh, he actually did a lot of experiments of kind of the sort that we saw uh, Van Dyke doing uh, in in that uh, or his students doing in in that that video, like you know, going out into the range and 
and and and like watching what cows eat mm. you know and like like that kind of thing was like <laughs> totally what he would do day in and day out and i remember kind of like you know going up into the range with him and like yeah looking at these 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 various like ecosystems and sort of like oh well you know what are the cattle doing how do they interact with the other animals in the ecosystem all that kind of thing um and i remember talking to him after watching this episode uh about about what it had to say and i feel like ecological thinking has moved a little bit away from uh the sort of assumptions of stability that were a powerful part of its foundation um but it's still an attractive idea, right? Uh, <laughs> um, it's an idea that's kind of really, really haunted us for a long time because it's it's ultimately kind of rooted in um, it's almost a religious idea, really, like the kind of belief in a a stable heaven um, that if only we could get there, um, it would be entirely tranquil and crystalline and peaceful. Um, and that that colors so much of how we think about everything like um and like maybe it's time to put that idea that kind of heavenly idea just put it in a pine box and bury it cuz we do in fact live in a highly dynamic universe uh we're we're a dynamic people our the entire world around us is dynamic and it's like i just don't know how much longer we can pretend otherwise right and i mean one thing we were talking about before was that we have this idea of like adapt or die survival of the fittest like you know um kind of like you you have to be an apex predator in order to to survive kind of view of life that is is commonly promoted in in the press like um like you know you you constantly have to be changing you constantly have to be um, adapting you have to be flexible you have to be innovative you have to be creative you have to be um disciplined uh and you have to be energetic and all that kind of thing um so that that is a very common uh way of thinking in our society um and in in the sort of uh the news um and in the the popular press but that idea is sort of complemented by the notion that either in an invisible sense this world of chaos is the best possible world because it is promoting some kind of equilibrium um, or that we are doing this in order to achieve a perfect equilibrium right that like this this notion of equilibrium is either to assume to be like present and invisible or something to come. Um, and, and, and I feel like when you talk to these sort of like real, like edgelord types about, um, you know, their sort of survival of the fittest, like fight or die kind of ideology, um, it all kind of comes back to behind all the cynicism, there is a, a sort of uh, faith in the idea that it is all justified by equilibrium concepts. Yeah, or like, yeah, that it is, you're right, it's, it's either an equilibrium that's present right now and this is the best possible world, or it's an equilibrium that we're evolving towards. Um, or it's just this kind of simple belief that um, if they participate in the chaos and they lean into it, that they will earn safety by doing that, that there will be some reward of stability and, and um, tranquility. Right. I mean, yeah, I guess that is uh, that is interesting because um, that, in a sense, kind of gets to uh, it's closer to Nietzsche's way of seeing things, which was not really an equilibrium kind of idea. He saw the world um, as being uh, primarily about trajectories of ascent and descent, right? Um, and I guess there was a sense of equilibrium in the, in the sense that, like, in order for there to be ascent, there must be 
descent, right? That like there was a there was a an opposition of forces, um, and the people who were uh, virtuous uh, would establish their ascent by stepping on those beneath them, right? By defeating others. Um, but there's, it's not like there's any kind of upper bound to where they go. It's just like, in order to keep moving up, you have to keep crushing those underneath you. Um, and, and I feel like that is, that is for some of these people, at least a sort of justifying idea that like, there is some kind of system of reward and punishment, um, that, that distinguishes the mer the, the, the meritorious or the the virtuous from from the unworthy um and the weak uh, but they're, they're always such fucking shit lords though like i mean they, they, oh they i mean it's not this, like it's like, a good idea no, yeah. <laughs> I mean, just, just try to see, see if the equilibrium concept factors in there and i think i think it, it's uh maybe but i i, I don't i don't think it, it's quite the same idea i fucking love um, those guys with their like yeah it's always this like Oh, you know, it's it's a dog eat dog world. Everyone, every man for himself. And I'm I'm like, well, okay, fine. If it's a dog eat dog world, and every man for himself, you and me, we go into a pit with knives, and if I win, I get all your stuff. Oh, I, I suddenly you want to get the state involved to protect you from this fucking lunatic <laughs> who's threatening you, right? You feel threatened now, do you, in this fucking Darwinian existence? It's like no, Jesus Christ! Like, come on. <laughs> yeah, like, like they have it, so little appetite for it in actuality. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, <laughs> I don't think we'll ever talk about it on this on this podcast, but it's worth reading the book uh, Anti Nietzsche. Um, uh, that it it talks a lot about sort of the conundrums that are brought in with this kind of thinking, but I, I think it is absolutely the case that um a lot of these people uh or maybe all of these people um they they put on a big show of toughness uh but they they also have a, a very sort of fragile uh a sense of self-worth and and are often uh coming from a real sort of victim uh mentality oh certainly yeah um but uh yeah, I guess it's a little bit off in the weeds here. Um, so I, I, I think that, I mean, to try to sort of bring it back together, it it's important to maybe um, find a point of view that is neither that which is guaranteed by um, a faith in a sort of non-existent equilibrium, uh, nor a faith that is based on pure domination right like that is like oh everything has changed and in order to establish any kind of um coherence in the world uh the only thing that works is a uh, conquest of the weak by the strong right like i don't think either of those models that sort of um equilibrium model or that kind of nietzschean model uh really offer us uh anything very attractive and no, no certainly um, not something worth living in and um you know like i'm i'm pretty convinced that we can build a dynamic and adaptable socialism that would be a sound basis for uh you know human adaptation into the next century and beyond um i'm sure it can be done um, maybe kind of exploring the ways it could be done is um, maybe a topic for a later later show. Yeah, and I, I mean, I think one place that I would say we ought to start is by getting a getting acquainted with uh, death and tragedy. Right, like these are things that we try to we try to avoid by appealing to these kinds of equilibrium concepts, right? That like, oh, well, the wolf kills the moose and it's gory and violent, but actually it's all to the service of the balance of the system that we live in, right? That like there is, there, there is like in the, the wolf 
uh, like tearing apart the moose and the moose is like screams of death and the viscera and the blood and everything. Um, there's something untouchable and beautiful uh, as a result of that. Um, and I think we can try to work towards some kind of positive dynamic vision by sort of acknowledging our own frailty and uh, our fear um, in the face of, uh, of, of our finitude, of our death, uh, or, you know. Kind of um, like recognizing, recognizing nature as it is, or like, like not, not just nature, because it's that kind of like big abstract sort of thing, but like recognizing ourselves as we are and recognizing all the creatures around us as they are and really recognizing the ways we relate to each other and the kinds of harm that we do to each other and like figuring out a way to live that better. Um, and it, it is going to require staring death in the face. Yeah. 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 And I, and I think that, uh, that's really a pressure pressing issue, uh, with the sort of ecological issues we're dealing with. Um, but you know, it's just a part of life as well. And, I think the other thing that may be useful is to pay attention to the metaphors that these assumptions are based on, right? Um, the way they tend to work is that they achieve legitimacy by referring sort of horizontally to one another and and say like they always pass the buck right it's like you if you ask someone for justification in one area they'll appeal to a metaphor in another area and it will just all kind of go around in a loop um but if we pay close attention to one of these metaphors one of these metaphorical areas like you know the body right um and sort of question like, well, what I'm experiencing, is it consistent with the assumptions that this model has? And like, if we can do that, then we can maybe start to see some seams and some cracks in the stability of this metaphorical whole and try to start to move it in a different direction. Um, you know, if you... Like, for example, uh, uh, the other day I was uh, doing um, uh, shiatsu uh, massage, right? Uh, was, so I was, I was, you know, massaging this person and um, trying to, like, get a sense of where the parts of their body were that were stiff and sort of, like, how I could uh, manipulate their body in order to, like, get them to relax um and it's easy to think about that in terms of bringing the body into an equilibrium state but i'm not sure that's the right way to think about it um that might just be lazy thinking right um and so i try at least to pay attention and think about other ways of conceptualizing what I'm doing. Um, and, and I think if we can do that in various areas of life, uh, we might be able to sort of overcome the assumptions of we all live in this network stable system that is, is like a body and like a machine and like an ecosystem. Um, and it is stable and it is, contains us and it makes us powerless um, or makes us simply automata to be moved around right um, I, I don't have any particular answers about <laughs> what what we need to do what we need to think in order to come up with that sort of socialist vision that can overcome some of the problems and pitfalls we've seen but I think that might be a place to start. Uh, certainly a fruitful uh, place to begin investigation. Um, because, you know, we need to be investigating things and um, new ideas are uh, badly needed at the moment. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, right. Like, so if if you work in computers, think about that. If mm-hmm. you work in finance, think about that. <laughs> if you work in body work, think about that. You know, just like pay attention to what you are experiencing and what lazy thinking may be getting you into. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, you all have been put on notice. Um, <laughs> is there anything else you'd like to cover before we wrap up? I think we've we did a pretty good uh, good tour of the uh, the film there. Um, yeah, I think we, we pretty much, uh, covered it except for the, uh, the one point that we mentioned before, uh, but we didn't talk about, uh, yet was, uh, sort of, um, and maybe we'll get into this in the, the final, uh, episode a bit more, um, is the concern that there is a kind of authoritarian, uh, Background to what what Curtis is saying in in this uh, in this series. Yeah, there's, um, um, it sort of it sort of concerns me a bit about um, a lot of his kind of films that like, um, and and again a lot of the a lot of his films are kind of pointing out these kind of like human follies and these kind of like um, failures of various movements, but um, in the face of that folly, Curtis seems to kind of like consistently appeal to. Um, like a return to sensibility or rationality or to like reasonable control um, as the kind of counter to these um, crazed and chaotic sort of movements of, uh, of people. Um, and I don't know, you know, I don't, I don't know how I feel about it. Yeah. I, I think that the point he makes about these sort of anarchistic systems um, that they actually afford a lot of power to people who sort of come into them with a lot of power uh and 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 there, there's a kind of disavowal of that power but it still functions um it is is a very good point um i think that it's possible to come away from these this series uh thinking that what we need is sort of a um promethean authority figure who can make changes um, but I'd like to think that there is a possibility in escaping the idea that we are all atomized individuals, um, that are within these sort of circuits of power, uh, we might have, uh, the possibility of making the kinds of political changes that, that Curtis seems to appeal to without ceding all of our authority to a kind of uh, uh, Napoleonic figure, right? Yeah. Um, um, I would hope so. And, like, it's it's kind of... It's perhaps a little frustrating in that um, the Curtis's way of presenting these films, it, it, it only implicitly sort of leaves you to imagine what he might think of as a, an ideal sort of um, system. And, like, I think he, he sort of consistently describes himself as, like, a libertarian sort of of a libertarian bend so i would i would hope that the kind of the the authoritarian read it, it's possible that that's just there because the the material is so disheartening that it all it all implies that kind of yeah the, the napoleonic figure to come along and grab the steering wheel and and really uh, get get all this stuff under control but i'm not i'm not completely sure that's actually there or maybe it is i don't know We'd have, we'd have to pick Curtis's brain to, to get more of that. <laughs> well, I'm sure we'll cycle back to this uh, question in the, the final episode. But uh, Yeah, yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that'll be in uh, two weeks from now. Uh, we'll be wrapping up with the third, mm-hmm. um, the third episode of uh, All Watched Over by Machines of Loving Grace. Um, yeah, thanks listeners for coming along with us on this uh, journey. Uh, if you haven't done so already, like, please do subscribe to the show. Um, Leave us a rating or a review or whatever it is, uh, whatever buttons are in front of you. Um, or probably more useful, just share us with your friends. Um, yes. Yeah, because we could we could use a bit more of an audience. Um, we're doing okay numbers, you know, but like, um, <laughs> this is this is a rather niche podcast. Um, and I'm sure <laughs> you might say that. <laughs> people who would enjoy it uh, might, you know, appreciate having uh, them, themselves turned on to it. Um in the meantime, you can also kind of find us on Twitter at GI Unit Pod. Uh, we're on Facebook as General Intellect Unit. 
Uh, we have our website, uh, generalintellectunit.net, and we're on pretty much all of the podcasting apps. Um, yeah, thanks for listening, and we'll see you again in two weeks. Thank you.